You're listening to the Platform Launchers podcast. I'm John Stonge, and it's great to have you with us again this week. This week, we have a very special guest with us. It's my friend, Jeff Brown. And maybe you're already familiar with Jeff Brown's name, but if you're not, Jeff is the host of the Read to Lead podcast, and he's also the author of the Read to Lead book. It just came out just last year, and the subtitle, I'm going to hold it up for our video watchers, so <laughs> Read to Lead, here's the book. I've got my copy, Jeff, all right, <laughs> just so you know. And um, and the subtitle is The Simple Habit That Expands Your Influence and Boosts Your Career. So, Jeff, welcome to Platform Launchers. It's great to have you with us. It's great to be here. Thanks for for having me, John. I really appreciate it. Well, we're we're grateful for your willingness to spend a little time with us. We've got our members club live here on the call, and uh, they're going to have the opportunity to ask Jeff a whole bunch of questions in our members only Q and A that we'll do after my conversation with Jeff here. But Jeff, as we start off, uh, I just wanted to start off by just asking you just the basic question of just tell us about your platform. How would you describe it? What elements would you say it includes? Give us an overview of that before we start digging deep into it. Yeah, I didn't have much of one to speak of until about 2013, and that's when I launched the Read to Lead podcast. Uh, so that was the the foundation of the platform, and then that grew into a course or a course offerings, um, which later grew to public speaking, and then um, coaching, and then masterminds, and a virtual summit. Um, I got asked to be an adjunct at a local college as a result of my podcast. So the podcast kind of snowballed into a bunch of other things, probably over the last nine and a half years, maybe 10 or 11 different income streams. Wow. Um, not all happening at the same time. Some are right. seasonal, some, you know, some come and go, some are, you know, there all the time. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I just kind of one thing led to another and over the, probably the first eight or so years, you know, I, I just was trying a lot of first, a, a lot of things I'd never done before that I was seeing other people do. And I thought, oh, that looks cool. I think I'll do that. And, and oh, I think I want to do that. And I, and, you know, some things worked, some things didn't. Um, uh, but the things that, that did work, you know, I stuck with and, and tried to grow and the things that didn't, I you know, went back to the drawing board and gave it another shot in some cases and other cases not. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but here, you know, it's been nine and a half years now or thereabouts since I, I launched. And, um, uh, it continues to be, you know, the, uh, the, the, the springboard, I guess you would say for, for all my various sources of income, it all begins and ends with, with the podcast. There's been, um, uh, sponsorships in there too. That's another income stream I forgot to mention along right. the way. So, so yeah, there, it, there's, there's all kinds of, of ways to, to grow a business out of that. Uh, but the main thing is, as I'm sure everybody in this group knows, and most people listening is if you're going to do something like that and you're not going to be consistent and good luck. <laughs> well, that, that word right there is one of the main things that we try and drive home. It's something we try and keep each other accountable with consistency. Mm. And that, so in the time that I've known you, I think I've known you probably for about two years now. And one of the things that I've noticed about your personality in that time is that you're very consistent. So you're the type, and tell me if I'm wrong about any of this. All right. But you strike me as the type of person that meets deadlines. So do you meet deadlines? Uh, yeah, I, I meet deadlines. I don't like being late to, mm -hmm. to, to, to things. I, I know you don't like being late because you were the first one to sign on to this call tonight, even before I signed on when Zoom told me Zoom told me that my password needed to be updated because it was compromised on a third party site. And I had already gotten the notice. Jeff Brown is waiting in the room. And I was like, uh, well, that's early. You were like it, 10 minutes early. Yeah, it was just me for a few minutes, but that's okay. That's OK. I, I like to be early. Yeah. OK, so that's your personality. But consistency yeah. has been one of the keys to your for platform sure. succeeding. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I'll admit in the first, you know, four and a half ish years, um, you know, I missed a, a publication Tuesday every now and then, you know, mm -hmm. I wasn't super as serious about it as maybe I, I could have been. I, I rarely missed Tuesday, mm -hmm. but still there were probably 20 or 30 over the course of that first four and a half years where I did. But I'm happy to say that if I make it till December, um, I will have been five years without a miss. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Knock on wood. So so I, I kind of turned a corner there and thought, you know, I need to get more serious about this. I've been fairly consistent, but I need to be more consistent. And so I just, you know, I flipped that switch. I made that decision and, and almost had that five-year streak going. So hopefully we'll be able to continue that for the foreseeable future. Yeah, that's 
I, I'm one of those people that has that same philosophy that you have related to consistency, because I think for something to gain traction. So mm. if you're developing a podcast, if you're developing a blog, any of these things, you're basically training your audience to trust that you're going to show up at a certain time. And if you stop showing up at that time, basically what you've communicated to your audience is to doubt whether you're going to do it. They, you, you now teach them you might do it or you might not do it. I have listened to podcasts through the years that just kind of faded away. And then eventually I stopped listening. And then you discover a few months down the road, oh, they actually released a few episodes here. And <laughs> I just stopped checking. And uh, and I, I suspect mm -hmm. that, that that's something that you've noticed as well. But your your podcast is focused on reading and leading and some of the things that go into that obviously if it's called the read to lead podcast and i'd be curious because this is where a lot of people get stuck a lot of people have the desire to start some sort of an online platform but they're wrestling with what their central message should be your central message is very clear and i'm wondering how did you land on it how did you come to that as your central message that you wanted to communicate well, uh, you know a little bit about this in, in that you, like I have, have a, have a radio background. I spent 26 years in radio, hosted a nationally uh, syndicated morning show for uh, six of those years up until 2008, came out of radio in 2013, started a podcast, and I felt like one of the best things I could do was to take all that I learned in those 26 years in radio and apply it to a podcast because I thought, it's not that different. I, instead of just driving to a studio every morning, I'm doing it from a spare bedroom in my house. So let me apply all those communication techniques I learned then to this and see how that works. And I found that those things work very, very well, uh, in fact. And so, uh, you know, I think, I, I think it's almost impossible to, to be um, too niche when it comes to your podcast mm -hmm. uh, topic or, or whatever it is you, you're writing about. Um, when I was first kicking around this idea, I would have, I remember a, a, a fairly successful, um, or I, I should say really successful um, influencer who I interviewed early on in the podcast life, he questioned the validity of, of what I was starting, you know, from a standpoint of, of a friend and saying, hey, I, yeah, I'm going to be interesting to see if this, this things work, if, if, if this thing works, you know, a podcast about reading and about books. He just didn't quite get it. He was an author. It didn't. It just didn't click with him. Hmm. Um, but what I found is, is over time, people have come to uh, trust me as a curator. You know, uh, with the podcast, I'm creating uh, these interviews every week. But it's the it's the author that's doing much of the heavy lifting. I'm I'm doing the question asking, and they're providing the content, if you will. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of borrowing their creativity. Uh, but there's value in that curation. Don't discount that. You know, it, it, there's a lot of value for people in that. And to be able to help people know what books to pay attention to. And over time, you kind of build that trust with them. And they think, well, gosh, if, if Jeff is focusing on that book, if he's featuring that author, it must be something that I should, I should look into. But, but my radio training taught me about how important that first 60 seconds is to, to grab people's attention. And so I try to basically hit a couple of different, actually five different notes in the, in that first 60 seconds, hmm. uh, that, um, helps answer the question, what's in it for me, because whether your listener realizes it or not, that's what's first and foremost on their mind is, is what's hmm. in it for me. Brad, who's here tonight uh, on the live call knows all about this. Cause he's gone through my, my training. Uh, but I, there's some, some sort of sub questions you have to answer. One of those is, is what am I listening to? And, and, and that seems very straightforward, but you'd be surprised how many podcasts I've heard where I'm a minute in and I don't even know what the name of the show is yet. <laughs> now, now, some will say, you know, well, well you've, you've got your device right there. Isn't, you've got the artwork right in front of you, right there it is on your phone. Well, more and more, I'm finding that podcast apps, much like music apps, Spotify and others, serve up things to you that they think you might like. So you might be listening and finishing one show when another one could start automatically that you didn't choose. And maybe your phone is across the room or it's in the seat next to you in the car or it's somewhere not otherwise convenient to grab. The first thing out of your mouth, in my opinion, needs to be that information is, is what are the, what is the name of this, sh this show? And, and what episode is this? What number is this? A lot of people don't number their episodes. That's okay. But I think it's a very useful way to tell the, a new listener right away, 
oh, this is episode 67. That means if I, I like what I hear, there's 66 others I might mm-hmm. want to go in and grab. And so I think that's, that's important to know. And it's important in those first few moments to treat the, the scenario, the, 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 the moment as if everybody listening has never heard you before. And that's, that's one way to do that is include the name of the show, include the episode number. Um, I, I won't go into all the details of the other elements, but suffice it to say that they collectively um, uh, or each one of them individually answers its own question, like what's in it for me or why should I care or questions like um, uh, what am I in for and, and, and these types of questions. And when you put the answers to these five questions together, collectively, they answer the question, what's in it for me? So in 60 seconds or less, that listener knows what they're in for today, what today's episode is about, whether they're a veteran listener, whether they're a new listener, they have all the information they need to make an informed decision as to whether or not to stay or to go. And as podcasters, as content creators, as hosts, we need to be okay with them saying, this is not for me today, I'm going to leave. But the thing is, is when we give them that information up front and they leave, they're appreciative that we didn't waste their time. Hmm. One of the best things you can do in the audio space, I think, is demonstrate to listeners every second that you, above all else, respect their time. Mm-hmm. And even though you've communicated to me that today's not for me, what you've just done, because you've given me that information so quickly and succinctly, is you've increased the likelihood I'm going to come back the next time to the next episode. And that's what each moment is about, is, is not so much how can I get you to stay right now as much as it's about what can I do right now that makes sure you come back again. And again, Mm -hmm. and again. And even in that moment, if they don't stay for that episode, if they're just discovering you, they may check something out from that podcast library and say, okay, this particular episode might not be, you know, my cup of tea, but this person's already demonstrated that I could trust them. They've demonstrated, you know, I I know that I'll, I'll, within the first minute of whatever episode I select, I'm going to get a good idea of what that episode's about. Yeah, yeah. I think it's important too to have a worldview uh, for, for podcasts in particular, but this goes for other forms of content. Um, I think it's, it's a, it's, it's communicating to the listener, um, why this is important to you and, but it's delivered in such a way that they realize it's also important to them, (laughs) if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. And so I, I think it's important to ask, um, let me see if I can, if I can explain this in a way that makes sense. Um, it's sort of an umbrella uh, for why you do what you do. You need to be able to explain, like if somebody says, Jeff, why do you do the read to lead podcast? Or why do you do whatever podcast it is? You need to have an answer for why that is. If someone were to ask me that my answer would be because I believe that intentional and consistent reading is key to success in business and in life. Well, that answer is meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if I said it that way on the show, you might go, well, good for you, Jeff. I'm happy for you. Congratulations and, and clap and move on. (laughs) <laughs> what I want to do is I want to frame that from a camera angle relevant to you, the listener. And so the way I do that is I say, I give you a, basically an ultimatum. And I say, if you want true success in business and in life, and oh, by the way, who doesn't, then guess what? In my opinion, intentional and consistent reading is a must. And so now I've just divided my audience. Either you hear that and you wholeheartedly agree. And so now I'm preaching to the choir Mm -hmm. or you hear that and you go, I don't know about that. I don't think I agree with that, (laughs) but you're intrigued. You're, you're um, curious. And so one group sticks around because they know they're going to get their beliefs affirmed. And you've got this other faction over here that sticks around because they want to hear you defend what Mm -hmm. you believe. And then you've got the rest who kind of fall away, who weren't, you weren't going to reach anyway. And that's okay. But yeah. you've been very upfront from the very beginning. This is who this is for. This is what I think. Are you on board? If so, let's go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. And I, I, you reminded me of a quote, and maybe you'll remember who said this quote. Uh, I don't remember who said it, but I, I recently had heard a quote that said something to the effect of, the person you are in five years is going to be determined by the people that you meet and the books that you read, right? The only change that's going to exist in you uh, five years from now, it's going to be related to the people you meet and the books you read. So who, who said that? Any idea? Charlie Tremendous Jones. Oh, that's who it is. Charlie (laughs) Tremendous Jones. That's right. Um, 
I even I even quoted that in a sermon recently, and I couldn't remember just now, you know, who uh, who said that. So mm. look at that. Look, you, I didn't even prep him for that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he he did you just I guess to be the host of the read the lead podcast the first prerequisite must be read all the books and all the quotes that have ever existed. You must be able to just interview. bring to the fore any quote at any moment. At uh, any <laughs> moment, that's right. And I didn't even quote it perfectly. I kind of paraphrased it, but uh, but just the same. But yeah, so you're pretty convinced. So you you say you have you have this worldview of listen, this is what it's going to take to succeed. Mm. Why are you so convinced of that? Because I I could even hear the passion in your voice. What makes mm. you so convinced that if I want to <laughs> succeed as a leader, if I want to succeed as a as a business person, if I want to succeed as someone who's doing platform development, why is it that I need to be a reader? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I spent the better part of my twenties not doing that. Uh, mm. It's a decade. I wish I could get back. Um, I consumed a lot of content, but most of it was entertainment driven. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I left school being glad that all the learning was over school educated out of me, the desire to want to learn and read oddly. Uh, but it wasn't until my early thirties when I was fortunate enough to be surrounded by people at a radio station that was widely respected across the country. All the stations I'd worked to, uh, worked at prior to that, I'd been at for a couple of years and kind of bounced around and they were sort of these little, you know, mom, pop run of the mill state, you know, they weren't really. Uh, didn't have a lot going on, but this somehow I, I fell in this position where I'm at this major, major station, well respected throughout the uh, throughout the industry, and I was suddenly, suddenly I wasn't the smartest guy in the room anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. I had I had I had looked for places where I could be that, because how fragile my own ego was, and here I was at a place suddenly where I wasn't that person anymore. But it's finally the moment in my career where I actually started learning something because I wasn't the smartest person in the room. Mm -hmm. And that mentor, who I was so fortunate to have around me, was a fan of books. And he, he reintroduced me to nonfiction and he helped rekindle that fire. If you read the, the um, dedication, my dedication in the front of the book he just held up, yep. you'll see his name and an author by the name of Seth Godin mentioned. Th those two have never met. It was my boss, Matt who happened to put in front of me a Seth Godin book, a book called Purple Cow, mm -hmm. which I just, just ate up. I mean, I just could not get enough. And when I discovered that there were people infinitely smarter than I was, who, and this sounds kind of stupid to say it out loud, but who had taken years of experience and knowledge and of successes and failures and put it in a book that I could grab for 20 bucks, and learn in, 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 in an afternoon what it took them 20 years to learn, I was like, sign me up. And so I, I just started reading voraciously from that point. That was 20 years ago. Um, and I also saw, as I think, a direct result from that mm -hmm. as I began to put into practice what I was learning, attempting things, trying things. I was in an environment, too, where, where it was okay to fail, you know, and, and pick yourself back up and try it again as long as you were trying. And as I began to do that, I saw like six promotions in a 10 or 12 year period or something like that. And, and I attribute it to the reading that I was doing, mm -hmm. um, reading about the industry, reading about, you know, at, at this time uh, or about five years into this social media started coming on. It's like, how does this impact what we're doing in radio? And mm -hmm. I need to be on top of that. And I became the de facto, the de facto go-to person for a lot of this knowledge. And then I began being asked to speak at different, um, uh, events within the company at this nationwide company and other places. And I'd never done public speaking before. So then I began reading about that and learning all I needed. To know. And it just, you know, one thing led to another and the career just, when I became a voracious reader, a lifelong learner, my career skyrocketed. And as I talked to other people who did what I did, um, and, and it wasn't the case with most of the people I worked with, by the way, but in other places, I found that their experiences were very similar to mine. They were, they were doing something anybody could do, but very few were, and it was paying uh, dividends uh, for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's certainly a motivator, right? If you're seeing the impact that it's making in your life, and then the people that you're observing and surrounding yourself with, you're seeing the impact that it's making in their life. Obviously, as you're trying to level up what you're doing and trying to improve in your industry, that's a high motivation for you to do it. But somewhere along the way, you decided to transition from traditional radio 
into podcasting and into some of the other platform development development things that you've been doing. And I'm curious, what motivated that transition? Was it something you read? Was it something that motivated you in another way? How did that all take place? <laughs> Brad is laughing right now because he knows <laughs> the answer to this question. <laughs> I can see the smile on his face. Um, yeah, that company that I worked for, the guy who hired me 12 and a half years earlier left. Hmm. And I've had this happen more than once. Maybe you've had this happen. Um, suddenly that person that was your champion is no longer there. Hmm. And a new regime or, or the higher ups go, hmm, what can we do now with this thing? Well, let's just say Jeff wasn't a part of that plan. Oh. <laughs> and and neither, so was uh, uh, several of my colleagues who all got let go on the same day uh, during a belt tightening period and uh, a, um, a reorganization period, let's say. Uh, mm-hmm. I've since heard it's referred to as Black Monday <laughs> Okay, <laughs> by, by those, by those who, who still work there. Anyway, so I was pushed out. But the funny thing is, is a few months before this, I was having a conversation with my wife. You know, my, my mentor having left and I was in my gosh, mid to late forties at this time. Okay. And, um, I was talking to my wife about, you know, doing something else about going out on my own. I didn't, I, I didn't sort of see myself doing radio much longer. It'd been 26 years. And I knew if I left this station that it would almost certainly, if I were to go to another station, mean moving to another city mm-hmm. and my, neither my wife or I desired to do that. We're just outside Nashville and all her family's here. Mm-hmm. And so that wasn't really a, 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 an option. And so we began talking about, well, what would it look like if I were to venture out on my own? And I had no idea, but we set a deadline of December 31st of that year of 2013. Mm-hmm. And this was like in March. And I think I kind of set that deadline because it just seemed like a really long way away and I didn't have right. to worry about it right now. Well, then in June, just a few months after we had this conversation, I got let go. And there was all this second guessing. I'd been praying about it. And I was like, well, you know, God, I felt like you brought me to radio and there's a great sort of origin story I can share there if you want to hear it. But, you know, here I am thinking about, is it okay with you if I leave? <laughs> I really, I need a sign, God, I need a sign that it's okay. Well, he gave it to me. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was, it, the timetable was moved up, you know, uh, six, seven months, but I didn't have to worry anymore about whether or not leaving was the right decision. That gave me the okay, the go ahead to say, okay, it's time to try this. It's try, it's time to attempt some of these things that I've wanted to do and, and really sort of feel my way through it in a lot of ways. Cause I wasn't really sure what that was going to look like. Um, and so when that happened, it, there was just a piece about it. I just knew that everything was going to be okay. Like I said, that was nine and a half years ago. I've been, you know, gleefully unemployed ever since. <laughs> and and somehow what we should call platform development, <laughs> you know, your path to becoming gleefully unemployed. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. That's kind of how I like to refer to it. Now it's not all, you know, rainbows and unicorns. I mean, you know, there's, there's tight times and there's, there's oh, not yeah. so tight times. Uh, but I mean, I can't complain. I, I, I wouldn't want it any, any other way. So you had mentioned before, that there are at least 10 different ways that come to your mind that you're that you've turned this not just into a hobby or something like that but truly into a career where this is a business that funds your life and your lifestyle and your financial obligations and and things like that what's the you know, if I could ask maybe like a workflow or kind of like if you had an organizational chart of how you're developing your platform and the and the importance of certain elements versus other elements, uh, what does that look like on on your chart or the way you have it organized? It starts where and then that leads to this and then that leads to this. How does that function in your economy? Yeah, great question. Yeah, it starts, uh, as I said earlier, the, the podcast is really the foundation for everything. But out of that comes uh, courses that I create, and I use the podcast and the email list I've built from that to promote uh, those courses. Uh, you know, my podcast is a marketing vehicle, uh, sort of the wide end of the funnel, if you will, of everything that I do. Uh, that's that free content I give away every week that sort of brings people into the fold that Hopefully over time, they get to know me and then maybe a little while later, they get to like me a little bit and eventually trust me, you know, that whole uh, uh, customer acquisition journey uh, mm-hmm. to the point that they, they join my email list and I get permission to, to send them, you know, information on occasion that is hopefully helpful and useful. And, and then that leads to maybe asking for them to consider making a purchase of something, a course or what have you. And so 
that's sort of the, 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 the most basic nature of it. But then out of that um, comes, uh, I've done some live events. Mm -hmm. I've done a, a virtual summit. I grew my email list by 85%. Several oh, wow. years ago when I did through a virtual the summit, summit through, through doing the, the summit, through the summit, okay. uh, public speaking, uh, and in-person workshops, uh, come out of, uh, of the podcast as well. Those are a couple of things that I love to do. Uh, I, I do some mastermind groups. I'm, I participate in one, a peer led, a mastermind group. Uh, I just met with them this morning, actually. But then there's also mastermind groups that I lead that I charge for that people, uh, and Brad mentioned earlier, who's here live. Uh, he's been a part of one of those in the past. Um, I do coaching in a couple of different areas, a podcasting being one of them, leveraging again, the radio background, mm -hmm. what I've learned there and helping podcasters uh, know what I know that, that sort of saves them a lot of headaches when it comes to starting something they've never done before. I've done uh, membership sites. I, I did a book club uh, that was membership driven. I'm bringing uh, some, some membership elements uh, back to the business here in the not too distant future. I've just started using a tool called Mighty Networks, and I've brought all my courses. I've got four or five courses that I brought under uh, Mighty Networks, and I'm building a community uh, that didn't before exist around all of my courses. And so not just a community with a single course, but anybody taking any one of my courses is going to have the opportunity to build a relationship with someone else in the course they're a part of or in some other course that I've created. So I'm looking forward to getting that off the ground. Um, uh, in the not too distant future, hopefully in the next two or three weeks. Um, but all of the, as I said before, all those things in one way or another kind of go back at the end of the day to the podcast. So the podcast but, is the hub. That's the hub. Yeah. yeah. It would be like the, yeah, the, the spoke on the wheel. And then all these, uh, the, I mean, I mean the hub rather, like you said, the hub and, right. and all these other things are, you had it right. And all these other things are <laughs> spokes, uh, uh, coming out. I read of, a book about it once, Jeff, <laughs> it, it, it was called the hub of podcasting. Oh, there you go. There you by, go. <laughs> by Jeff Brown. <laughs> but yeah, that, so as you're describing all of that, I really like that recipe because one of the things that, that I'm convinced is that it's very useful to have multiple streams of income, especially if you're somebody that's venturing out into entrepreneurial waters and you're mm. trying to build up an online platform and you're trying to to do things where you, you have a, a robust and healthy income that's not necessarily following a traditional metric. That way, if one thing is working and another thing isn't, okay, that's fine. I've got this that's working for me right now. Maybe advertising is working and sponsorships. Mm -hmm. And then the next month, okay, well, it looks like this mastermind's getting off the ground. And then the next month, it's it's okay, book royalties are doing well. We didn't mm -hmm. really even get to your book yet, but that's coming next. I'm going to ask you something about that in just a moment. But even before we get to the book, I have an advice question mm -hmm. for you because uh, a lot of times, so here in Platform Launchers, one of the things that I know a lot of our members uh, debate or discuss or really wonder about is pricing and how to price different things that they're doing. So if, if they're doing a sponsorship, what should I price that at? Mm -hmm. if, the, if they're doing a speaking opportunity, what should I price that at? Coaching. We were even talking before we went live with the podcast, uh, how much to charge for coaching, how much to charge for courses. Can you give any pricing guidance for any of these things? You know, what would be in your mind, what are some target pricing options that you would say, yeah, that's fair, to charge for this thing and for this thing. Could you give us any guidance in that regard? Sure, sure. And this has been a struggle for, I'll just be upfront and transparent, it's been a struggle for me, uh, the entirety of my my business. I, I, I'm i always second guessing myself when it comes to pricing. I'll just say that right out of the gate. Um, I have some very specific advice when it comes to podcasting and sponsorships. Uh, and I may not be the first to have said this, uh, but I was just uh, helping a friend with this very thing uh, just over Facebook Messenger the other day. He was asking me about uh, how to price uh, her at her sponsorships for, for a particular uh, person who was interested. And she was worried about her number of downloads and, and how relatively small those number of downloads were. Would they even be willing to spend money with her? And I think one of the things a lot of podcasters don't realize is, is, you know, I talked about niching down as, mm -hmm. as far as you can. One of the things that that does for you is it gives you a lot of strength, uh, meaning that when um, an advertiser is looking at you uh, and, and considering you, if it's the right advertiser, they can look at your audience and go, 100% of the people in this audience need what we offer <laughs> mm -hmm. because you've been so specific with what it is your podcast is about and what it is that you do. 
And that gives you, I think, the opportunity to, to decide, okay, what's the minimum amount of money I'm willing to accept in exchange for interrupting my content with an ad? Hmm. Figure out what that number is and charge that at the outset. Uh, this particular podcaster averaged, and, and by the way, uh, she was thinking, well, you know, I average about 250 downloads per episode, and that's typical for the average podcast. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, well, what do, you, what do you see over 30 days? Is that 250 uh, after a week? She said, yeah. I said, well, what about 30 days? Because that's really what an advertiser is going to want to look at. That may not be much more than 250. Maybe it's 300. But that's what they're going to want to see is what happens after a 30-day period. And, and you know, figure out your number, uh, your, 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 your dollar amount, uh, what it, what, what's the least amount you're willing to charge to interrupt your content with an ad. And, and if they balk at that, then let them walk. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But you, you have to take into account, well, I'm going to be doing this extra work. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to um, interrupt my content. My, you know, that's something that I, I don't do lightly. <laughs> my listeners maybe up to now haven't had that as part of the deal. And maybe now all of a sudden they do. And so what am I willing to accept in order to do that and quote unquote, put them <laughs> through that, if you, if you will. And so if people walk based on that number, then I wouldn't worry about it. Then you just keep chugging along. Now, over time, if you keep getting no after no after no, then maybe you consider backing off the pedal. For my coaching, when I first started podcast coaching, I charged what I thought was a pretty high amount. And the first 13 people said no. And so I backed off a few hundred bucks. And as soon as I did that, I got my first taker. Mm -hmm. But in a year, I was able to raise my price to what I originally wanted it to be. And since then, I've raised it two or three more times. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, it's not, a, it's not always, a, uh, I mean, there is a science to it, but you're not always going to get it right, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So, but apart from deciding, you know, what's the least amount you want to accept to interrupt your content with an ad as far as podcasting is concerned, there, is a, there does come a point where advertisers are going to want to pay based on, you know, number of downloads. And there's a whole right. sort of industry standard formula. You've probably talked to your mastermind about some of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you can look at those numbers. And those are really beneficial if you have a lot of downloads. But if you don't have a lot of downloads, really the key is deciding what you're willing to accept, um, niching down as much as you can. And then when somebody does say yes to you, knock it out of the park. Mm -hmm. I remember having a, a sponsor uh, approach me and telling me how much of a fan they were of my show. And I went, oh, this is great. And then I talked to some podcast friends and found out that half a dozen other people got the same story that I got and it wasn't really <laughs> my show. That was a little bit of a letdown, a little e e ego uh, bruise there. But anyway, right. um, I found out too, a lot of my podcast brothers and sisters um, had not gotten their sponsorship money. They were approached by the sponsor and the sponsor said, hey, we usually do like six weeks and we give it a try. And if it works, then we keep going. If it doesn't work, then we don't. And for those they did try for six weeks, they didn't come back. The sponsor didn't get the results they wanted. And, and, and the others, they didn't even attempt. Hmm. Um, and when that same uh, sponsor approached me, again, because of the radio experience and background, and you'll appreciate this, John, I said six months, not six episodes or six weeks, six months. And they went, uh, no, <laughs> which I figured they would. Mm -hmm. But they said, would you consider three months? Would you consider 14 episodes? And I'm like, okay, we'll do that. Right. So I negotiated that. And the reason I did that is because I knew enough about audio listening to know that the average pair of ears needs to hear a message 10 or 11 times before it starts to sink in. Mm -hmm. And six times wasn't enough to see results, to see a response. But 14 episodes, that was enough. And so around nine or 10 episodes in of that sponsorship, they reached out and said, Hey, we're, we're not really seeing any, any results yet. I said, Hey, I told you. Give it, give give it time. a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And with, with, with the time that sponsorship was up, they were ready to renew. They'd renewed for another 14 episodes. They came back and said, hey, we want to do it again. I said, no, you don't. They said, what do you mean? I said, look, I've proved myself. I asked for six months in the beginning. It's time to do six months. So they did six months. And one month into that, they re-upped for another six months. Oh, wow. And at the end of that, they said, 
hey, we want to do it again. I said, no, you don't. I said, what do you mean? I said, it's time to do a year. <laughs> so <laughs> they did a year. With each one of these iterations, I stipulated that 100% of the, of the run be paid up front. Mm -hmm. And if you'll do that, I will. So I quote this amount. If you'll, if you'll do it up front, then I'll give you a discount per episode. And every single time they paid up front. Now, when they did a year in particular, that was a nice little, that was, that was the equivalent to half my, my book advance, <laughs> you know, wow. when they did that. So, so I love it when someone's going to give you money for something for the next year that you were going to do anyway for free. Right. Right. A lot of people I hear, you know, poo-poo advertising. There's not a lot of money in that. Look at all these other things you could do. You can sell your own things. Well, I can still sell my own stuff in the midst of selling other people's stuff. It's not either or, it's both and, or it can be, right? Right. I didn't stop talking about my own products and services when I started promoting other people's stuff. You did both. I did both. Yeah. It was nice to have that check up front, again, to do something I was going to do anyway for free. Totally. And by the way, your podcast has uh, influenced me to buy certain books. So you have definitely, uh, even the guests that you have had <laughs> on your show, I have made purchases after listening to your show. And uh and this, and this is where I want to finish us up tonight as far as our uh, interview here. And we'll certainly mm -hmm. let our members ask some, some questions here in just a moment. But last year, you released the book, Read to Lead. And I have a copy here in my hand. I actually think I got it. I think I got this like immediately upon, I, I think I ordered the pre-order. I think I, think I had did, the yeah. pre-order of this. Yeah. And um, and I, I'm curious here, um you know, traditional publishing is something that a lot of us think about. Uh, one of my books, most of my books are self-published. Mm -hmm. One of my books, my most recent book is traditionally published. And um, I'm just curious uh, what that experience was like for you. And uh, maybe even you, quickly, you could maybe tell us a little bit about how your platform led to that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And uh, what counsel, what parting counsel would you give to somebody considering the pursuit of a traditional publishing contract? Yeah, certainly the podcast uh, as a platform was super helpful. And, and traditional publishers, if that's the route you want to go, that's the, one of the first things they look at is they want to know you have somebody to sell your book to other than your family and your friends. And so if you, <laughs> if you can demonstrate you have a platform uh, that's attracted to them. I, I worked with a co-author on this book, uh, someone who uh, interestingly had uh, found an agent, had some experience in, in the book world, actually, and, and wrote a book uh, similarly themed with a different title and sort of ran it up the flagpole with this literary agent and didn't get any bites. Hmm. And the main criticism or critique he got back was you don't have a platform. Mm -hmm. And he came to me about a year after this and said, hey, this, I've got this book idea called uh, The Reader's Edge. Uh, and this is right up your alley. And would you ever consider co-writing a book? And I'd always wanted to write a book. No surprise there. Mm -hmm. uh, but it just never gotten around to it, as they say. Uh, and, and quite frankly, the whole thing overwhelmed me. And when I thought about the idea, uh, as he presented it, of co-writing a book, I thought, I only have to do 25,000 of the 50,000 words. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's instantly how my brain thought i'll have to do half the work that's not actually how it worked out uh but suffice to say that was sounded very attractive to me so i reached out to his literary agent and and signed with him which was nothing i mean just an email and going okay here's I the contract you. you know yep uh you just ask and um and then from there he and i uh put the book together over the course of of, of several months uh, or I should say actually a marketing plan and a promise of a book or a few samples of writing of a book. Um, and it was the, the marketing plan. I was just talking to a friend about this uh, a couple of days ago for an interview for my show, who is coming out with a book in January on Tyndale house. Mm -hmm. um, and very similar, very similar thing. The marketing plan was the difference maker for him, for his book uh, and for me. And, and my book is that was something they were really impressed with. So don't discount the marketing that you're going to do for the book and that you can leverage your network to do for you. Um, and so that was a big uh, piece of the puzzle. Um, the first, uh, well, I'll, I'll share this. I've shared a little bit of, of sort of uh, uh, kind of my, my prayer life here in one of my other stories earlier. Mm -hmm. But I remember sitting here at this very desk and um, I had three books I was in the process of reading, getting ready to do interviews on. There was a Grant Baldwin book, a Michael Hyatt book, and a third book. Uh, I can't remember the woman's name now off the top of my head. And 
all people I respect, even the person whose name I can't remember right now. <laughs> but <laughs> as I looked at them, I thought, oh, look at all these, all these are on Baker. Wow. What are the odds of that? These, these, these authors I'm preparing, they're all on Baker books. And as I thought about them and their histories, I thought, man, boy, how cool would it be to have a book on Baker books? Mm-hmm. Boy, Baker would be cool. Kind of said that out loud. Two days later, got a call from that agent who said, hey, we've got one bite. That's awesome. That's all you need, right? <laughs> Nobody's going to bid right. over this book, but we got to buy. Who is it? Baker Books. <laughs> oh, okay. How awesome is that? So <laughs> Baker Books uh, published it, and um, uh, it was you know great experience all in all. Uh, little little bumps here and there, but you know I wouldn't I wouldn't do anything differently. And um, you know there's there's lots of pros and cons to traditional publishing versus self publishing. You know right. uh, you know all about that. Sure. Uh, and certainly have nothing against self publishing, but uh, am, am appreciative to be able, as I know you are, to be able to traditionally publish a book as well. Yeah. No, it's a great opportunity and it's a great book. And I'd encourage people to check it out. Read the lead with Jeff Brown. Well, Jeff, in just a second, we're going to segue over to our members Q&A. But before we make that segue and finish up the podcast here, if our listeners and our viewers would like to follow up with you and, and find out more about all the things Jeff Brown is doing and all the ways that Jeff Brown could coach and help and, and guide and direct some of the things they're doing, where's the best place for them to do that? I would say going over to read to lead podcast.com uh, and, or search read to lead in your favorite podcast app. <laughs> and then the, uh, the newest site is uh, jeffbrown.me. Uh, and that's where I'm beginning to build uh, the community. It's not uh, quite ready for prime time yet, but you can check out what's going on over there with regard to courses and that sort of thing. Jeffbrown.me. Awesome. Jeffbrown.me and read to lead podcast.com. And if you're not already a listener to the read to lead podcast, I'm telling you what, it's a very, very good podcast. It's hosted well. Jeff does an awesome job with it, and he asks good questions and finds some great guests to interview. Like I said, he's, uh, books have been sold to me because of my listening to Jeff's show. So uh, I, 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 uh, you've definitely, um, you, at least on a small scale, you've definitely benefited your listeners because of uh, the book sales that you've made for them. But Jeff, it's been awesome to have you here on the podcast and thank you so much for your wisdom and insight related to platform development. And I'll just let our listeners know that if you want to join us here in Platform Launchers, we always love to invite you to take a test drive of what we've got going on. You could visit us at platformlaunchers.com and you could take a free two-week test drive. And if you do that, you'll be able to see the next part of what I'm, I'm going to be doing with Jeff, our members-only Q&A conversation with our members as they can ask Jeff essentially anything. We'll see, Jeff, is that all right if they just ask you anything? You know, is it is it just going to be like a uh, like no holds barred. Absolutely. AMA. It's ask me anything. All right. Ask me anything. So we're going to, you, will be able to check out that part. It'll be in our video archives and you'll be able to check out so many more things that we have there. Just check it out at platformlaunchers.com and you can take the test drive, but that's it for us this week. We look forward to catching up with you again next time. And in the meantime, have a wonderful week.